Good morning, everyone, and uh, it's good to see you. If you're a visitor here today, um, welcome. We're glad you're joining us. Uh, we're um, doing a series in the book of Judges. So would you bow with me in prayer before we get into word this mor- the word this morning? Lord, we thank you for your word and what it teaches. We thank you for the, the stories of the Old Testament and what they show in regards to the nature and uh, natural course of man without you. And Lord, how you desire people to come to you and to surrender their lives in, in, to you, Lord. So we pray this morning that as we go through the word in the book of Judges, that you would give me uh, strength to speak what it is that you've called me to, to share with the folks today. And God, that you would open our hearts to hear from your Holy Spirit what your word says, Lord. And and that we would just uh, we'd benefit from this, and we'd grow strong in our faith, and that we'd we'd understand um, you better. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, Amen. Amen. So, the Book of Judges. I think I mentioned it last week. A very deep and disturbing book. Lots and lots of things in this book that stir us and go, "Wow, that's crazy. That's sad." <laughs> There's a lot of things in this book, and, a, and, a, and any close examination of the Old Testament book of Judges is bound to leave the average person with a very unsettled feeling. And some people over history have read this book through the wrong set of lenses, and it's actually led them to have disillusionment, I think, with God as a result. It's very important for us to see what the book of Judges is teaching and to point in the right direction the way that God would have us understand. I, be, I believe that God meant for us to experience a disturbing sensation when we read this book. It tells a very violent and tragic tale outlining the consequences that take place when God's people forsake His Word and each person does what they see fit to do in their own eyes. So it's a tale of progressive corruption, both in the human leadership of the judges that we're going to be looking at as we go through this series, and also within the general populace. And in a nutshell, Judges outlines for us the story of Israel's demise and its failure to follow through with the promises that they made to God under the leadership of Joshua. It paints a picture of a nation that progressively spirals out of control under the weight of sin. Today we explore this book, starting in the first part of chapter 2, reading from verses 1 to 6. So we start, The angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I brought you out of Egypt and led you into the land that I swore to give to your ancestors. I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall not make a covenant with the people of this land, but you shall break down the altars. Yet you have disobeyed me. Why have you done this? I have also said, I will not drive them out before you. They will become traps for you, and their gods will become snares for you, to you. When the angel of the Lord had spoken these things to all of the Israelites, the people wept aloud, and they called that place Bochum, and there they offered sacrifices to the Lord. So the people of Israel, we see in this case, they were given a choice. If you recall, Joshua said in his final address to the people in Joshua chapter 24, 15, he said this, and if, it seem, and if it seem evil unto you, to, unto you to serve the Lord, choose this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord." 
So the people of Israel were given a choice on that day, and together they rose with one voice and said, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. And with this choice, we see that this did not happen. The people chose to reject the advice of Joshua. It is sad. It's heart-wrenching. Upon entry into the promised land of God, they did not continue on the righteous path that God called them to continue. Their attention was diverted by the ungodly culture around them rather than being rid of the influence of the Canaanite tribes that dwelled in the land and purging the land of promise of these influences, the people were enamored by those influences. They left the altars of the Canaanites standing in their new promised land, and they then forged covenants with their wicked culture. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the people at Gilgal, And if you know what Gilgal is, okay, Gilgal is the place in the promised land that the Israelites came to first when they crossed the Jordan River. It's the place where they entered the land and God said, go and take the land. It is also the place where the men of Israel were first circumcised. And I know this is a weird talk in our culture, right? It's a weird talk, but they were circumcised at this place called Gilgal for the first time. It was a ceremony where the men were physically marked by the cutting away of the flesh to show that they were different from other men in the world, and they were to live a life that was consecrated and given over to serving the Lord. They were to be different. They were to be in the world, but not of the world. They were to be the ambassadors of the truth into the nation that they were, into the land that they were taking. They were to be an ambassador nation to the whole world. Out of all the men in the world, the Israelite men were called to be set apart as a people who would be consecrated to the service of their God, the only God the creator of the heavens and the earth. The angel of the Lord in this place in Scripture was no normal angel as we think of angels. He was not a messenger of God like Gabriel or some other heavenly servant messenger we commonly think of when we hear that word angel. But in this case, The angel of the Lord has a specific Hebrew meaning. The angel of the Lord, wherever you see it in the Old Testament, is not referring to a messenger angel. It is referring to angel as in appearance, representation of God. The angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, when we read it, is the representation of God, not messenger. This is what theologians call a Christophany or a theophany. Now a theophany, if you, I'm going to wax into a little bit of discussion on this word. Theophany sounds, ooh, theophany, right? What is a theophany? Okay. A theophany is a manifestation of God in the Old Testament that is tangible to the human senses. In, In the most restrictive sense, I guess you could say, it is the visible presence of God that appears to people within the Old Testament writings. As such, when God appeared to Moses in the burning bush, for instance, that is a theophany. Or when God led the children of Israel through the desert after they were released from captivity in in Egypt, they're in the desert, and they are led by a, a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day, And God would meet with Moses and there would be a physical physical pillar of cloud or fire. That's a theophany. It's a manifestation of God in the physical given to people. A Christophany, on the other hand, okay? Now, if you think about theophany, theo mean, what does theo mean when they say theophany? Theo, theology, the study of God. Theo meaning God. Appearance of God. 
Okay, Christophany is appearance of Christ. Okay, so we know that the Lord our God is one, but the Lord our God is one consisting in three persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All three in one. One God, three persons. So when God appears to people in the form of a man, every place in the Old Testament where God takes on human form as the angel of the Lord is, in fact, a Christophany. Because Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. He is God's revelation to us in the flesh. Jesus Christ is God with skin on. And when he appears to people prior to the birth of Christ, prior we call that the incarnation, prior to the incarnation or the birth of Christ, where God takes the form of a man, what we're seeing is a pre-incarnate form of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is a case in the scriptures where there is a Christophany. The angel of the Lord came to the place where the people of God were consecrated originally to service to him. He came and met with them there. And he confronted them over certain things that were taking place and were not taking place. You see, the angel of the Lord, when we read in the Old Testament, is a foreshadowing of Christ's incarnation and the birth of the Messiah, where God took the form of man in Jesus Christ. And don't get me wrong, it wasn't, it wasn't just an appearance of that. Jesus Christ was fully God, and he was fully man. He is the God-man, both fully man and fully God. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as Yeshua, our New Testament Joshua, who leads us to conquer the promised land that God has given to us as a spiritual inheritance, the second person of the Trinity. God the Father, who is the first person of the Trinity, never shows his face to human beings. Because if you were to see the face of God the Father in all of its brilliance and glory, you would die. The majesty and power coming from his being would consume you. When Moses was speaking with God, he wanted to see the Father God face to face. If you recall in Exodus 33, 18 to 21, it's written, Then Moses said, Now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause my goodness to pass in front of you. I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy upon who will I have mercy. And I will have compassion upon who will I have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. This brings the fear of the Lord to a whole new perspective, doesn't it? Our God is so far advanced in his holiness and power. That he shines like radiant beam. And no one shall see the face of the Father, no human being, and live. Then the Lord says, there's a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. And then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. So in this case, here, in Judges 2, 1, God visits Israel as a, at this place of of, of consecration at Gilgal as the angel of the Lord or representation of God. He has a message for them. God walked through the land from Gilgal to Bochum. And Bochum is the place where God confronts Israel over their failure to be consecrated into his service and to purge the land of their inheritance from wickedness. God tells the Israelites that because of their disobedience and failing to remove the altars of Canaan and the promise, in the promised land, they're insistent on making treaties with the ungodly influences that were living there. There was going to be consequences for all of this. 
The angel of the Lord told them, I will not drive them out before you. They will become traps for you, and their gods will become snares to you. And upon hearing this, what was the response of the people? The Bible says that the people wept. The Israelites wept. They wept and they wept and they wept because they understood that what the Lord was saying to them was truth. They understood that the land that they were living in them was filled with things that were not right and they were cut to the heart, so they wept. They wept. But still, even though they understood the evil of what they had participated in, the evil of what they had given themselves over to, and it brought them to tears to see what it had been doing to them and their families. They did not repent. They would not repent. It did not lead them to change anything. It was a flash in the pan of, yes, I understand, God. I'm sorry. You know, we can be sorry for the things that we're doing in our lives that are not pleasing to God, but still hold out in our spirit by not repenting. Repentance means to turn away from what you were doing and to go in the completely opposite direction of that. Now, in application to us as people today under the new covenant, okay? When God calls us to take complete possession of the spiritual inheritance that he's given us, it's a land of promise. Your spiritual inheritance is a land of promise. He's called us to possess that land and to break down the altars and to get rid of the things that, are, that, that were, would cause an offense to the Lord. Through Yeshua, if we refuse, if we refuse to allow him lordship over our land, over the altars that are exposed in our land, in our spiritual inheritance, that need to come down. If we refuse to allow him lordship over this, and we insist on making unholy alliances with the evil culture that we live in as Christians, we too will find ourselves plagued by spiritual defeat on every side by our spiritual adversaries. The Word of God is true. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You see, if we approach our faith in a way that we think that we can do this alone, we're going to be just like the Israelites. We're going to fall. We'll begin to make covenants of evil, being deceived by our enemies who desire to render us ineffective and unproductive in our faith. And the enemy will try to convince us that he is actually our friend. But do we understand that the enemy comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. He is no friend of ours. Our spiritual adversaries that are all around us are no friends of ours. They have only one thing in mind. Rendering you ineffective and unproductive in the land of promise that God has given you to possess. So, they only wish to rob us of our inheritance. Really reduce God's influence in our spiritual lives and make us their slaves. Now we may find ourselves when confronted by the angel of the Lord who says, why have you not torn down the altars? Why have you made unholy alliances with the people in your land? Why have you done this? We may find ourselves in a place of sorrow and weeping and conviction weeping over the consequences of our sin, but still being stuck in our hearts without the strength in ourselves to turn from disobedience to obedience and change. To be changed, my friends, to be changed, we need God's assistance. We need Him. We need the Holy Spirit to fill us and work in us and through us because if we approach our faith 
merely from a philosophical perspective and we try to do the right things and we try not to do the wrong things, we're going to end up in a place of misery because we will not be able to listen to the Lord our God because our hearts, our hearts in our sin nature are disobedient by nature and prone to wander from the Lord of hosts. God desires for us to call upon his name. And the reason why Joshua and Judges were given is to show that it is not by might, not by power, but is by my spirit that anything happens that is good in this world, in this life, for the believer. If you try to do this on your own, if you try to navigate your faith on your own strength, you are going to get plowed under. You will not succeed because your adversary is more powerful than you are in your flesh. But greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. This is a promise in the word of God. You don't have to live in defeat. The good news is we do not have to live in defeat. We do not have to allow the enemy to run us over, to have possession of things in our hearts, in our land. The altars can be broken down. The enemy can be vanquished. But it is not by might. It is not by power, it is by the Holy Spirit of God that you will triumph. And that is all. We can't do it in our flesh-driven hearts. We can't do it. In the New Testament Scriptures, in Hebrews 3, 12 to 13, the Word says, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Those messengers in the land that try to allow you or try to convince you to make alliances with them, to, oh, it's okay, you can just, you can marry up here. and You can compromise here. It's not going to hurt you. Oh, what's the point of, there's no problem with another altar in the land I, you, we all know who you really serve so you can serve God and just let them let that altar be and just let it be you don't have to break it down sin is deceitful friends and if we walk in the flesh we will be deceived we will be deceived and we will be overcome we can't trust our own flesh driven hearts to stay true to God Proverbs 14 12 says this there is a way that appears to be right but in the end it leads to death in my mind, it's I. I can look at a scenario and I can go, I should do this and this and this and this. And I'll try to do this and this and this and then I find that I'm doing exactly the opposite of what I really want to do. Why is it that I don't do the things I want to do and the things that I... You know that whole thing with Paul the Apostle? Right? This is what I'm talking about. See... The Israelites at this place in their existence were being overcome by the enemy. Why? Because they tried to do things through their own reasoning. What's the, what's the harm in a little of this? After all, you know, everyone else is doing it. What's the harm of a little of that? After all, everyone else is doing it and they seem to be doing okay. Hmm. So it gets you thinking. Okay. It's here that God will take us if we've allowed altars to remain in our spiritual land of promise, if we've allowed altars to remain, if we've made unholy alliances, here God will confront us at, at Gilgal. In our spirit, he'll say, it's t- why have you done this? And we will be given an option. He will lead us to evoke him in the spirit where we weep, where we understand our need for him where we are brought to tears because we see the brokenness of our lives because of our disobedience. Oh, Lord, speak, and we will cry when we see what's happened in our lives because of our disobedience. It's here where we're given options by God to humble ourselves before Him, or we're going to cycle right back into the disobedience that brought us to where we are in these tears just like the Israelites continually cycled back, cycled back into disobedience, cycled back. God is desiring, Father, that we are more than conquerors, that we, under the new covenant in the blood of Christ, 
that we become progressively more like Jesus to sanctify us, to, to help us to overcome and not to go back, not to return to that land where there are enemies at work. In James chapter 4, verses 8 to 10, it's written, and this is scriptural, folks. If you see that God's putting a finger upon your life, if I see that, then I ought to be sorrowful. I ought to humble myself before him and weep. But I ought to pray, oh Lord, help this not to just be an emotion. Help this to be repentance, oh God. I see where I've fallen and I see that I need you. James 4, 8 to 10 says, Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be, wretch be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and He will exalt you. Oh, it's counterintuitive to humble ourselves in our flesh. Because in our flesh, when we humble ourselves, it, it's like we're saying, I'm, I'm relinquishing control. And the human spirit wants control. The human spirit wants to be God. The human spirit wants to call the shots. But God says, humble yourself before me. If you want freedom from your flesh, if you want freedom in the spirit, then you need to come to me and humble yourselves before God. And in due time, he will lift you up. The secret to spiritual success in this life is when we humble ourselves before God, we see God for who He is and we fall before Him and say, change me, God. I can't do this on my own. Help me, Lord, not just to be weeping at Bochum, but to repent at Bochum. Brothers and sisters, the Canaanites did not demand that the Israelites forsook worshiping God. The Canaanites simply encouraged Israel to join with them in worshiping their false gods along with the one true God, Yahweh. But God regarded this duplicity or double-mindedness as abandonment of Him and the covenant. Spiritual apostasy bore bitter, bitter fruit in Israel. They began to disintegrate and slide into disunity, hostility and tribal conflict among themselves. As Christians, it's no different in our spiritual promise line. Just like Israel, if we prostitute ourselves spiritually with false gods and immoral sexuality, like Asherah worship, or materialism and sacrificing our families on the altar of success and work and prosperity and the things of this world like Baal worship was. If we bow to the Asherah poles and we bow to the Baals, then we will bear the same bitter fruit as the Israelites bore. Again, we must understand though, that modern-day idolatry is not only confined to our desire for sexual fulfillment or material fulfillment. Those are two major areas where the enemy brings an attack and tries to throw us into disarray, for sure. But modern-day idolatry, friends, is the misdirection of our worship. It is the elevation and glorification of anything other than God. Idolatry is rooted in a deluded understanding of God where we undervalue the things that are elevated where we overvalue the things that are elevated above him and we undervalue him ah, disregarding his worthiness to receive all our attention dismissing the fact that he is a holy god and he calls us to be holy even as he is holy disregarding his sacrificial love for us or diluting his truth by polluting it with other ideas. Other ideas. And the Bible tells us those other ideas are not actually just our own. The Bible calls those other ideas that take us away from God's word and God's plan as the doctrine of demons. Because your enemy is a Canaanite that wants to dethrone your place. He wants to render you ineffective and unproductive in your possession of God's inheritance. He wants to steal your joy, your peace, and to steal the great fruit of righteousness 
that is going to be yours in abundance because of the Lord working in and through you. He wants to take that away and leave you barren and hurt, crippled in this world. As Christians, we need to be wary of our sin nature. We need to be on guard to watch our life and our doctrine very closely. We have a new nature of spiritual life through Jesus that has brought us into this land of inheritance. And many of us are experiencing the freedom of the land and, and the fruit of the land in the Spirit. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. I love it. The fruit of righteousness is grand and it's good. And the land that He's given us to possess is great. And it can be even greater. See, it could have been greater if they would have continued on the campaign that Joshua had called them to. But it was cut short. Because we must be careful lest we be deceived by our spiritual enemy and we allow that enemy a place to roost. For as it states in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 11 and 12, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Consider the words of the Apostle Paul to the believers in Corinth. In Corinthians 10, 10 to 22, he says, So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation is overtaking you except which is what, what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can, be, you can endure it. Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. You hear that? This is to the church. There's a parallel between here and what's happening in, in, in Judges. Flee from idolatry. I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, and we who are many are one body, for we share the one loaf. Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? Do I mean that food sacrifice to an idol is anything? Or that an idol is anything? No, but the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to be the participation in participation with demons. You cannot drink the cup of Christ, the Lord, the Lord, and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than He? You see, sadly, the Israel, the people of Israel wept and they wept, but they did not repent. And shortly after the shedding of tears and weeping occurred, because the weeping and tears were not accompanied by a heart that was humble before God, a heart that was truly repentant towards Him, the angel of the Lord's word was fulfilled in Israel as we read Judges 3. These are the nations the Lord left to test all those Israelites who had not experienced any of the wars in Canaan. He did this only to teach warfare to the descendants of Israel who had not previous battle experience. The five rulers of the Philistines, all the Canaanites, the Sidonites, or Sidians, and the Hivites living in the Lebanon mountains from Mount Baal Hermon to Lebo Hamath, they were left to test the Israelites to see whether they would obey the Lord's commands, which he had given their ancestors through Moses. <sighs> Folks, God knows our hearts. God will often let gateways to temptation stand in his children's paths to test their resolve to wholeheartedly commit themselves to love him. He does not tempt, God does not tempt, nor can he be tempted. But the Lord permits us to be tempted or tested 
by the system of this world, which is Antichrist, by our own flesh, which left in its own devices is also Antichrist, or the devil who is chief, and he is Antichrist. God will often permit us to be tempted or tested by the world, the flesh, and the devil because it appears, according to the scripture here, that the freedom to choose between Yahweh and another option to be true to God or to willfully disobey Him is a necessary thing to demonstrate the validity of our true love and commitment to Him. Is love in its truest sense possible without giving us this choice? I don't believe it is. For example, Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 13, 1 to 3, he says this, and it's talking about deceiving spirits that come and deceiving people that come to try and lead us away from the truth. If a prophet or one who foretells by dreams appears among you and announces to you a sign or a wonder, and if that sign or wonder spoken of takes place and the prophet says, let us follow other gods, gods you have not known, and let us worship them, you must not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer. The Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love him with all your heart and with all your soul. It is therefore the Lord your God you must follow, and in him and him you must revere. Keep his commands and obey him. Serve him and hold fast to him. You see, this is what God told the Israelites and they are unable to do it because they tried to do it in their own fleshly strength. And this is why the world needed a savior. You see, because despite all the warnings that God gave Israel and his invitation for the children of Israel to love him and to obey him, they found their hearts wandering and unable to keep themselves free from their own corrupt and disobedient hearts. The Bible speaks with perfect accuracy here describing our human condition. And the book of Judges reveals, and I know this is a weighty sermon today. It's weighty, but it's meant to be. God desires it to be. He wants you to know that those temptations, those trials, those tests that you're facing, he allows them to persist because he wants you to turn to him. He wants you to turn to him and to abandon your own strength and your own device to figure it all out on your own and to cast yourselves upon him because he cares for you. The book of Judges reveals the worst of man. Yet this is another evidence that the Bible is inspired by God, right? Because it tells the truth. If this mer merely were a human book, it would present man in the very best light, wouldn't it? always putting the best foot forward. But that is not what we read in Scripture here. Instead, we discover its pages to contain the very real struggle with sin that a believer faces. The Bible, particularly with the unfolding story of Israel and Judges, contains God's diagnosis of the human dilemma. There is, you see, the heart of man being desperately wicked and prone to wander from God leads us to the point where we recognize our need to, to have a Savior who delivers, a Savior who rescues, a Savior who heals. It points to our need for Jesus, our new covenant Savior, Messiah. He needs to step into the picture before we can do the things that we know we ought to before God when we recognize, even as Christians, when we come to this place where we recognize that we've given some ground over to our enemy and our spirit in our land of promise that he's given us, where we have that bokum, where we can cry and weep and wail, and our, our heart is turned toward him, 
But now we have a valley of decision. Will we repent? Or will we just be sorry for the consequences of our behaviors? Hmm. So let's look at Israel. They didn't follow the right path here. The Israelites lived among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. They took their daughters in marriage and gave their own daughters to their sons and served their gods. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and they served the Baals and the Asherahs. The anger of the Lord burned against Israel so that he sold them into the hands of Cushan Rithiam, king of Aram Naharim, to whom the Israelites were subject to for eight years. So they forgot. Their tears were forgotten. And they continued to embrace the things that they shouldn't. And as a result of living amongst the unconquered foes in their land, we see that intermarriages took place and that idols were worshipped. And this is a lesson for us. When we, make common when we make common alliances with our, with our uh, enemy, and that can sometimes take root in the fact that we make unholy alliances with other people that are not believers, particularly in the case of love and relationships. Don't forget what Baal and Asherah were all about. Asherah. Asherah worship involved immoral prostitution of, our spirit, of the spirit to another god. When we make common alliances with our enemy, whether it's a spiritual enemy or someone that the spiritual enemy has planted in our path, to throw us, the unbelievers usually end up influencing the believer for the worse, not the other way around. May we learn from this. It's still a principle true under the new covenant. As Christians, if we yoke ourselves with the wrong things, we too can be led astray. Sometimes God has grace and rescues us from that when we recognize it, but very often we end up going into the wrong places. You can't scoop fire into your lap and not be burned. 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. And God has said, I will live with them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. God wants unadulterated hearts that are not bowing down to any high places outside of him. Because he is higher than, he's the rock that is higher than us. All right. But no other gods before him. No high places. God is can help us to escape the, the oppression of Kushan Rishayim of Aram. Kushan of double wickedness. That's what his name means. Double wickedness. <laughs> the Israelites gave themselves over to Baal and Asherah. Ah, Asherah. And because they did this, they inherited an enemy who oppressed them in double wickedness. You see, when we give way to the Canaanite deities in our hearts, it can be something that we think is harmless. It can be something that we think we can deal with. We don't understand that the armies of, of darkness are doubly wicked and devious in character. And we will find ourselves in a place of impoverishment spiritually. Soon, the rug will be pulled out from under us. Soon, 
the, the idol will show its true colors for what it is and the power behind it. Soon, we will be crying out to the Lord again. Save us from our circumstances. Save us from the oppression. Where did the oppression come from in the beginning? It came from the people not submitting themselves to the Lord their God and not following through with the obedience that he asked them to obey in. And all of a sudden now Israel's in this place where they're under the oppression of this Aramean king of double wickedness. But God, under the new covenant, folks, God has given us overcoming and keeping power by the work of Jesus in saving us and depositing within us the Holy Spirit. And His law has been engraved upon our hearts if we believe. He engraves His law upon our hearts and helps us to overcome the enemy. Helps us to put aside the, the ways of death. Galatians chapter 5, 16 to 18 says, So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Why? Because the law of God is written upon the tablets of your heart. And when the law of God is written here, it is no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Blessed is the man who walks not on the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the mocker, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night, and he shall, he shall be like a tree that is planted by the rivers of water, which brings forth its fruit in its season. His leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. The God of heaven declares to his children that he desires us to walk in the land of the righteous, so that we will flourish, so that the fruit of righteousness will hang from our Vows, so that we will shine like stars in the universe as we hold out the word of life to a generation of people that walks in abstract darkness. They don't know what binds them. They don't want, they know what takes them down. But God, who has saved us by his own blood in the new covenant, has given us hope and a future. We don't have to be downtrodden. We don't have to be in the way of the Canaanites. We don't have to follow through and become uh, oppressed by the, by the king of double wickedness. We can walk freely. We can be free in him. This is the point of, Josh, of Joshua to show us how it happens when we try to do it ourselves. But the new covenant offers a way, a truth, a life that is free from the shackles of darkness. Rise, church. Don't allow this king of Aram to ruin your heart. God has given you a promise. God sent a judge. In this case, a judge was sent to rescue them. And they overthrew this king. I won't continue. They overthrew this king of double wickedness. And God gave them peace in the land for eight years. Boy, I wish it would have said, and God gave them peace in the land and they repented and they continued to serve the Lord for the rest of the days and here we are. No, that's not how it happened. <laughs> they had to learn again. So we're going to talk some more about that on our next series, or our next um, message. But I trust that God would bless you and keep you and may his grace and peace rest on you. And may you be overcomers, more than overcomers in this life. Amen. Let us pray and I'll ask the worship team to come forward. Lord, we thank you for the blood that you shed on our behalf. We thank you, Jesus, that you are the God-man who delivers, who saves, delivers, and heals your people. Father, you understand the weakness of our spirit more than we understand ourselves. So God, today we come to you just like the Israelites did, Lord, and maybe you put your hand upon us, Lord, and you said, hey, tap, tap. There is an altar here that needs to come down why have you allowed this to say steep in your land? Put it away. Put it away. For I have called you and I have given you strength. You call upon the Lord, he will send one to your aid. 
and help you to overcome and to purge the land of your heart from the idols. God, we come to you with sorrow. Some of us look at the wreckage that has been made in our lives because of our disobedience, Lord. The choices we've made along the way, the wreckage that lay in the wake, and we cry. This is our bokum, Lord. Father, you've said that's okay. We should be grieving and sorrowful over the things that were unsurrendered, that broke us, that have caused us to be unproductive in our faith. But Lord, we want to be different than the Israelites of that day. We don't just want there to be alligator tears. We cry out to you, God, to change us. Have your way in us, Lord. Create in us a new heart. Renew our right spirit within us, Lord. Help us. Help us, Lord, because we can't be true to you with our own strength. We need your spirit. Holy Spirit, we surrender to you today. We surrender the throne of our hearts and ask that you would rout anything that's in us that is not of you so that you might dwell in our land and we in yours in power, in might, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. His grace and peace rest on you.